Hello everyone, I'm Hamish Hamden and I am back for season two of The Dogs. I am the yin to Johnny's yang, the upside down to his Latroy Hawkins, and the raking pitcher to his DH rule. To my adoring fan, wondering where I've been between seasons one and two, well, as you know, my beloved Union Jacks lost our season one final, so I've been dealing with that by plotting to overthrow the UK Prime Minister. I'm recording this video in late June, so let's see how well that statement ages. Today, I'm bringing you the 1981 Reds versus the Pittsburgh Crawfords. It's a matchup between the only major league team with the best record to fail to make the playoffs and a Negro League team who were never allowed to make the majors, let alone the playoffs. So it's a story of redemption, not unlike the classic two-part Star Trek The Next Generation episode. And like that episode, both teams will be hoping to cling on to a victory that gives them an enterprising start to the season. hoping to make it so for the 81 Reds is Bruce Berenyi. And although his initials are double B, he's more like a double A because he gets no support at all. This is a man who once pitched a one-hitter and lost the game, and picked up four losses during a nine-game run when his ERA was under one and a half. He doesn't know it yet because if this is 1981 Bruce, but in 1982 he will lead the league in losses while having an ERA of 3.36. Let's see if he gets any run support today. Hoping he doesn't is the Crawford starter Satchel Page. Page did get into the majors eventually, but not until he was 42, a number that may have been the answer to life, the universe and everything on a completely different page, but was too late in Satchel's career for his prime to be showcased. However, this didn't prevent Joe DiMaggio once calling him the best pitcher he'd ever faced, and Joe should know, there were very few people he didn't hit. Let's get into the action, and how about we kick this season of the dogs off with pretty much the same play looping seven times. Sounds riveting. Here we go. Page to Collins. Strikeout. Page to Griffey. Strikeout. Berenyi to Bell. Strikeout. Berenyi to Gibson. Strikeout. Where's Enrico Palazzo when you need him? Okay, Foster. Strikeout. Uster. Strikeout! Patterson! Strikeout! Okay, enough of this. Let's see something, anything else. A double play from Bankhead? Good enough. Two innings in the books, no runs from either team, a lot of strikeouts. As Bob Seeger famously recommended, let's turn the page and see how Satchel does with the bat in his hand. Not bad as it turns out, a single gives a glimmer of a scoring chance to Cool Papa Bell. Aside from an outstanding nickname, Cool Papa Bell was known as a man with few vices. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke, and he didn't swear, although that last point is sorely tasted here as Page comes too far off the base and Bell hits into a double play. Bottom of the fourth, and like a kid in the 80s with only one video game to his name, we're back to punch out, over and over again. Berenyi gets Dixon, then Charleston, then Gibson, to all strike out. We go to the fifth feeling like Johnny Paprika's college days at a bar and thinking scoring is impossible. Although there is a chance here in the top of the fifth. Ray is our knight in shining armour as he singles to put men at the corners. Berenyi is tempted by a squeeze play, but that fails to chart, and it's up to Collins who, and stop me if you've heard this one, strikes out. Bottom of the sixth in this pitcher's duel, and Bell with a one-out double. Two batters later, Charleston gives Berenyi something to chew over as he puts men at the corners, and will this be the moment we get runs on the board? That's a big old no. Gibson lines out, and our exciting season-opening matchup to attract new viewers and welcome back old fans is still scoreless heading to the eighth. Enter Rap Dixon, a man with an incredible 13 clubs in his 15-year career. This man changed sides more times than an Othello game piece, and a single here puts men at the corners. Dixon's not satisfied with that, and steals second to avoid the double play. And finally, we're not giving out an MVP, but we are awarding an Oscar, as Charleston finally puts a run on the board with a huge single. Gibson's name has been said a couple of times in this video, usually just preceding strikeout, but this time he crushes that most exciting of all plays, the sack fly, and the Crawfords head to the ninth with a two-run lead. 
Harris finally replaces the stellar Satchel Page, and this final out of the game gets the Pittsburgh Crawfords a 2-0 win and a 1-0 start to the season. Spare a thought for poor Bruce Berenyi, who pitched into the 8th, gave up one armed run and still takes the loss. However, today's satchel is stuffed full of stats. 8 innings pitched, 13 Ks, just one walk and even a run scored. I know, when you tell people of your love for the dogs, they may raise an eyebrow at watching pixelated sprites hit a simulated ball, but when you tell them it was a pitcher's duel, oh baby, the dogs are back. Follow that, Johnny. We've got one hell of a pitching matchup in today's game as we pit the 6 out of 5's Gaylord Perry against Diamond in the Rough's Walter Johnson. Altogether, these guys account for 43 years in the league. It's number three all time in innings pitched against number six. It's number two on the career pitching war chart against number 13. It's number one in career shutouts versus number 13. The prodigal son of a family that obviously was playing it safe with their boy's name against, um, uh, Gay Gaylord Perry. Both pitchers look strong coming out of the gate, but Gaylord Perry blinks first in the second as both Ernie Banks and Joe Maurer double to lead off the inning. It's 1-0 Diamonds in the Rough, and it only gets worse in the third as Nat Lajaway gets a bit of a cheapy home run at 350 feet. Still counts though, 2-0 Diamonds. Mike Trout is the very next batter and he says, my Schwartz is longer than yours, and goes for 417 feet. It's 3-0 Diamonds. It's the bottom of the fourth and Walter Johnson still hasn't given up a hit. And spoiler alert, he's not gonna give up one here. It takes two pitches to get Alfonso Soriano to fly out. Ken Caminiti might need a bigger syringe next time. And Bernie Williams? Looking more like Bernie Madoff, but no one is buying. Hitless through four, and it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Some called Walter Johnson the Big Swede, which is weird as he was born in the British Isles. When asked why he never corrected anyone, he responded, well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I know a lot of Swedes who are nice people. It was reported that he would take it easy against one of his buddies and Sam Crawford when he came to the plate in low leverage situation. This is the guy whose windup looked so polite right before the ball singed the hair off your nipples as it blew by you. Anyhow, it's the top of the fifth and Gaylord's in trouble again. Men are on second and third with one out and Mike Trout is at the plate who's already homered once but oh he goes down swinging and Ernie Bates says I'll have what he's having. Gaylord Perry is keeping his team in it with a little clutch pitching of his own. Someone needs to pet this man down. It's a good thing that the more stringent checks on pitchers using foreign substances started much later or the average length of a Gaylord Perry ball game would be about five hours. The name of his autobiography was Me and the Spitter. In that book, he promised that he would play cleanly from then on forward, and then went right on cheating anyhow. The thing was, everyone knew he was cheating and Perry wanted them to know. It became a type of psychological advantage above and beyond just the advantage of doctoring the spin on the ball. Prior to a pitch, he'd start fidgeting with just about everything. His hat, his pants, his belt, his hair. Didn't matter if there was a foreign substance there or not. Just making the batter think that there was changed their approach at the at-bat. There's great stories about him greasing up his hands before shaking the hands of the opposing team just to plant that little seed. And once he even rolled a greased up ball, quote unquote, accidentally into the opposing dugout. These mind games aren't to say that he didn't actually cheat. Oh, he did, and often. His substance of choice was Vaseline, but he prided himself in trying everything. Every substance the doctor sent to his pregnant wife, onto the fingers it went to see what it would do to the ball. He once bragged that he even tried fishing line oil. The coup de grace was when he turned behind the mound and saw the rosin bag there. He racked his brain for the knowledge of a rule against his plan, and when he didn't find any, he went right ahead and started rosin bagging the ball up like it was a lady's powder room. The powdery ball exploded out of his hand in a cloud of rosin, much to the surprise of the hitter. The MLB had to doctor rule number 8.02, which now adds, neither the pitcher nor any other player shall dust the ball with the rosin bag. Back to the action. In the bottom half of the inning, the Sixes finally land their first hit and in fact go back to back with singles out of Joe Carter and Harold Baines. A walk loads the bases and Jason Veritek cleverly places a ground ball to avoid the double play and bring their first run home. Two run ball game. Top of the sixth, and you can hear Gaylord Perry yelling, That's it, boys! Get on my back! We're taking this one home! Just as he 
throws the ball away in what would have been the third out of the inning. But instead, Joe Maurer comes across the plate to score, erasing the run the Sixes had put up previously. Maybe the WD-40 was a bad idea. To be fair, both pitchers pitched an excellent rest of the game as not much happens from here on out. Walter Johnson ends up going eight innings, only surrendering three hits, and you've seen two of them, striking out eight and only giving up one run. Gaylord Perry wasn't too shabby either, but just like the rankings at the beginning of the video, he was just a smidge worse. It's 5-1 to one entering the bottom of the ninth after Mike Trout added an RBI single to his stats in the top of the inning. After R.A. Dickey of the Diamonds allowing two men to reach, they turn to Trevor Hoffman to shut the door. And he does right in Alex Gordon's face. Diamonds in the Rough join the Pittsburgh Crawfords at 1-0 to kick off the group stage. And aside from the stellar outing out of Walter Johnson, we should also highlight Mike Trout. He's got his first dinger of the tourney and went 2-5 for five driving 2 home. Nap Lajouet, who, no thanks to Wikipedia, I now know is actually pronounced Lajouet, scratched out three hits to get off to a nice start. Tomorrow, we're going to get our first look at Group B with club snubs Brett Saberhagen taking on the Black Soxes. Eddie Seacott. The back end of the double feature has the young Pedro Martinez from the 94 Expos taking on Smokey Joe Wood of the Tucson Tucsons. We're going to try something new this year. It's time for you all to play Nostradamus and make some predictions. Now that you know the upcoming matchups, tell us who you think is going to win and by what margin in the comments. If this takes off, we'll track everyone's picks throughout the season and come up with a reward for the most accurate viewer. That's going to do it for me, but next up on the Doug Sports Network, Aaron Rodgers takes on Antonio Brown in the Tide Pod Challenge. We're well aware of the inherent dangers of this and have warned them many times, but they've done their own research and we're behind in our ratings, so it's pod time. If you like what we're doing here, please consider liking this video and getting a shiny free subscription to our channel as that's the most direct route to the Dugs becoming a thing. And as always, for Hamish, I've been Johnny Paprika, hoping all of your balls are fair and all of your wood is good. Good night, everybody.